I haven't looked at the ecological emergency yet. I'm Dr Tristram Wyatt. I'm a senior research fellow at the University of Oxford and also at University College London. Exploding levels of human consumption have been destroying the natural world much more quickly than it can recover for decades and now it looks as though climate change is going to make things worse. Well, I'm a biologist. I spent my life working on animal behaviour and I've written an award-winning book all about animal behaviour and pheromones. Now, the problem is that having studied the amazing behaviour, think of David Attenborough, the amazing behaviour of animals around the world in all sorts of different habitats, what I ought to be doing is writing a book about those, the third edition of my pheromones book. But as I started to update the book, I realised that many of the animals are going to be dead, extinct, in the lifetime of the students who will be reading the book. So, for example, coral reefs are a big part of Chapter 4, and you'll know that as the oceans are increasing in temperature, the direct effect of global heating, those will be gone in the next 10, 20 years. So, basically, a whole range of life will be disappearing along with all the fish and the crustaceans and everything else that subsists on those coral reefs. Frogs. Frogs are also disappearing as their habitats disappear and what this means is I went through the book so many of the animals would be going extinct. So what I'm interested in is gosh you hear scientists say there's a great risk that animals will become extinct but you seem quite precise about it. How, how are you able to know certain species are definitely going to go so far as the coral reefs are concerned, we know that they're hugely at risk because we can see the direct effects of the El Nino and other heat waves in the oceans. And we know that in those years, that's when we get the greatest bleaching and we can match the bleaching to the temperatures. And what we're seeing is that the projected rise in temperature means that it will simply go above their lethal threshold for temperature and we know that they'll simply die and those habitats will disappear and they won't come back. That's the really scary thing. These are tipping points. Once the coral is dead, we can't replace it from somewhere else. And, and you said about the frogs that are in danger as well. Can, uh, can we be that certain that they're definitely going to go? Or? With all of these things, there may be frogs in some habitats that survive, but this enormously diverse group of animals are very much at risk particularly not just from climate change, but also habitat loss. And sometimes the two are combined. Because what happens with rising temperatures is that animals have to go to cooler parts up the mountain, and at a certain point, they run out of mountain. In this video, we're going to look at how frogs could become extinct within the lifetime of people who are alive today. To be able to understand why, you need to become frog experts, and I can help you to become that while I walk through the woods in a completely natural and unrehearsed way. The first thing to know is frogs are amphibians and that's a really ancient class of species. Its amphibians were the first vertebrates to leave the oceans and come onto the land. They're really archaic, they're cold-blooded, which means they can't control their body temperature. It makes them vulnerable to climate, to the, out, to the ambient temperature and it limits how much energy they can use at any one time, how powerful their muscles can be. But that doesn't matter for frogs because they're not very good at travelling. They can hop short distances to catch their prey. And a frog will eat any insect or slug or worm it can get in its mouth, so they're not picky eaters. But they can't travel that far because they, they just hop and almost crawl. But it doesn't matter that they're not very good at travelling because they don't have a very good respiratory system. They do have lungs, but compared to us modern mammals, they're not so efficient. They can breathe through their skins, but that makes them vulnerable to diseases and chemicals because their skins are almost porous and also their skins always have to be kept wet. Also, compared to mammals, frogs aren't very clever. They don't do very well in laboratory mazes when scientists try and test them out. If you're watching this video, and I think from the comments I get on the channel, most viewers are mammals, it's quite possible you feel quite smug at the moment because mammals, we're sort of more advanced. Efficient locomotive systems, better respiratory systems, more intelligent. 
warm-blooded so we can control our body temperatures and less affected by the climate. But in Britain, most frogs in Britain are common frogs. Once you've got past the tadpole stage, a common frog can expect to live between five and ten years. Compare that to a fox, which is obviously a mammal. A fox might expect to live between one and four years. And in fact, 80%, 80% of foxes in Britain are less than one year old. Because being mammals, they need a lot of food because they're warm blooded. Most foxes in Britain die from starvation or from traffic collisions. Frogs, which are cold blooded, don't have that same problem. They don't need to eat so often. The average frog might only need to eat uh, two or three times a week. Given all the disadvantages they have, how do frogs get to live so long? It's because they're specialised to the habitat where they live. There are frogs that live in the Arctic Circle that can withstand having parts of their bodies uh, frozen solid. There are some frogs that live in desert areas and they can survive five years of drought by staying in their burrows in their own little, little cocoons to keep their skin moist for five years and they wait five years for the rains to come and they come to life. Amphibians exhibit a wide variety of life history and reproductive strategies. Some species give birth to live young while others raise their tadpoles in a skin pouch like a kangaroo. Some amphibians lay eggs that develop directly into miniature forms of adults, where others retain their juvenile characteristics like gills, even to adulthood. This enormously diverse group of animals. In case you wonder what I'm doing, I'm walking around the woods pretending to look for um, tadpoles or frog spawn. I've been coming now and again in February and March, which is when the tadpoles and frog spawn should be around. I couldn't find any, but we'll just pretend for the sake of the video, we'll just walk around the woods and pretend we're looking for tadpoles. So, frogs are specialists, mammals are generalists, mammals can travel, so they haven't been evolved to be so um, reliant on specific habitats. That's the first message of the video. Without being able to control their body temperature, frogs use their habitat by hiding under leaves, sitting at the bottom of ponds, using abandoned burrows to avoid getting too hot or too cold. Wherever you live in the world, your frogs will do it slightly differently, but they'll still be frogs. They do, however, have two disadvantages. Number one, their porous skins are vulnerable to disease. Amphibians are especially susceptible to environmental change that should therefore receive particular attention with respect to study and conservation. Two features of amphibian biology have been widely cited as underpinning this hypothesis. First of all, they're typically naked and permeable skins make them highly vulnerable to chemical pollutants and radiation, and also to disease. Not only are they highly evolved to the habitats where they live, they really need two habitats to survive. Secondly, the life of many species requiring both aquatic and terrestrial habitats to be maintained in suitable conditions is more at risk of extinction than species that only need one habitat. So now you're all experts in frogs. I'm sure you can see what the problems are. A frog will hibernate during the winter time because it can't control its body heat, so it needs to warm, warm weather. They come out in early spring. They have to get to the pond to reproduce. A frog might live up to about three kilometers, which is about two miles away from the pond. Toads live a bit further away, but let's stick to frogs. Because frogs travel so slowly, it can take them between one and four weeks to get to the pond. It's a great journey. Remember, they don't do very well in laboratory mazes. They're not very clever. They're not great at learning things. They tend to travel to the pond in a straight line. Why do they travel in a straight line? We don't know. Maybe they're able to um, detect Earth's magnetic field. Maybe they're able to smell the pondweed. There's no point in trying to find out now because they'll soon be extinct. So they're heading in a straight line across roads, Half of the population of a, a colony of frogs could quite easily be wiped out by a single busy road. In fact, 
a single road has been responsible for the complete extinction of a local uh, frog colony. Also, if you're not very good at navigating mazes, if a frog comes along a low wall on its journey, on its straight line journey, then it just causes mayhem with the, uh, their migration. Can you see? Can you see the problems of being a simple ancient creature? Some frogs have got poisonous skins, but most frogs are fairly defenceless and slow moving. So they avoid predators by being nocturnal, only come out, coming out at night long enough to hunt which means their enormous journey of one to four weeks means every day they have to find somewhere safe to hide. Now, if they get to the pond, it's not guaranteed the pond will have water in. A frog really needs to find a freshwater pool where there are no fish and there's no fast flowing current because that would wash the spo uh, frog spawn away. Fish will eat the frog spawn. Frogs do best of all in temporary pools that just form in the spring, in the spring rain. And it might sound like quite a risky strategy, but there are pools in Britain that are temporary every spring that have been there for 8,000 years. Frogs and newts find temporary ponds a welcome place to breed and thrive without their eggs being eaten by more established life, such as predatory fish. A temporary pond might fill and empty over time. In the UK, some glacial ponds or depressions that temporarily fill with water at certain times are thought to be more than 8,000 years old. Being a temporary pool, there's a risk that if there hasn't been enough rain, the pool won't exist. And if that is the case, then the frogs will go away and they'll come back the next year. And the year after that, they won't go off and try and find new pools. And that's because frogs have been around millions of years. They cope with droughts. Remember, they could live to five or 10 years. They cope with droughts by just waiting for the drought to end and the rains to fall, that one year, maybe every other year, every three years, they manage to reproduce. They lay thousands of eggs. Suddenly there's a great explosion in the frog population. And it's the new frogs that go off and, and find the new pools. And they have to, because suddenly there are thousands of new frogs in the area. Well, this is a problem because if say, your pool was on farmland, and the farmer has improved the land so that pool no longer forms or if your pool was on a housing estate now and somebody's built a house on top of it the frogs will just keep coming back they won't try and find a new pool because the frog life cycle expects the world to get back to normal just as soon as the drought finishes so 93 percent of all frog extinctions are due to habitat destruction, farmland, building, deforestation. <laughs> so far then, there aren't any surprises. For decades, humans have been destroying the natural world more quickly than it can recover. Frogs are just one of those victims. But then, 30 years ago, it was realised that amphibians were in decline, not just in places where humans were, but in remote places like high altitudes in the United States, in forests in South America and remote parts of Australia. But when people looked, they found it was humans after all. Humans had introduced drought into rivers in South America, which ate the frog spawn. In parts of the United States, there was a new disease that was having a devastating effect on amphibians, which we'll find out a bit later on. In Australia, I can't remember what it was, but it was down to humans, whatever it was. And it was all written about in a book called uh, The Ecology and Conservation of Amphibians by someone called BB. The rest of this video is a comparison of what BB forecast 30 years ago and what the scientists say is happening now. And it's surprising how prescient they were. One of the major causes of extinctions in amphibians is a disease which started off in China it was brought across by humans, so I'm going to count it as an invasive species. Chytridiomycosis, a deadly infectious disease caused by the fungal pathogen Batrachotrium dendrobatitis, represents one of the major drivers of biodiversity loss in amphibians. During the 1980s through mid-2000s, BD spread globally with amphibian communities in Australia, Mexico and Mesoamerica and the Andes of South America and the Western US the hardest hit. 
how many species now near in the brink of extinction or worse. Unfortunately, the damage is nowhere near done. BD is still making its way across Africa and has not yet been detected in Melanesia, where its introduction would be a severe threat to the region's amphibians. As yet, no treatment has been developed that effectively treats the disease in wild populations. Now for climate change. There are 8,000 species of amphibian in the world and it's thought officially about 3,200 are at risk of extinction, which is 41% of all amphibian species at risk of extinction right now. But I think it's worse because they don't seem to be taking into account the impacts of climate change. Here is a map showing where they think the risk of amphibian extinctions are. So light yellow is where there are few species of amphibian at risk. Dark red is where there are lots of species of amphibian at risk. If you have a look at this map that shows where the amphibians live, you can see there's quite a lot of amphibians, the dark blue colours where the most amphibians live, there's quite a lot of amphibians live in the Amazon rainforest. For each hectare of the Amazon rainforest, supports on average 33 different species of amphibians okay so it's really important if you look back at where the scientists say amphibians are at risk of extinction the amazon rainforest isn't shown at all but some people say the amazon rainforest has reached a tipping point or will very soon reach a tipping point where it will start to transition to a grassy savanna and stop being a rainforest that isn't shown in the extinctions also, if you look at how many species of amphibian live in West Africa, it's quite possible there would be a risk of extinction, either through drought or from extreme weather events like flooding. This might sound a bit bizarre for an amphibian to be disrupted by uh, flooding, but we'll see about that in a minute. Anyway, climate change. The biologists realise what a devastating impact climate change will have on the habitats of amphibians. Remember, amphibians are specialists that are very dependent on their habitats. Due to their limited dispersal ability, frogs can't walk very well. It takes them one to four weeks to travel three kilometres or two miles. Many amphibians may struggle to adjust their distribution in response to shifts in the availability of suitable habitats. Some species may be able to migrate towards cooler or more humid areas, so long as suitable habitats exist but others atop mountains, on small islands, or in remaining patches of forest may, however, have nowhere to go. Because what happens with rising temperatures is that animals have to go to cooler parts up the mountain, and at a certain point, they run out of mountain. Strong dispersers, like mammals, like humans, rats and foxes, all who have devastating effects on, on frogs one way or another, strong dispersers are less at risk while well, species with low dispersibility, small ranges and long lifespans. Does that remind you of any creature you've been talking about? Many plants, especially trees, many amphibians and some small mammals are more at risk. That's the current science. Although, with our, now that we're all frog experts, we could have told them that, couldn't we? We know all about how frogs will suffer because they're so dependent on the habitat and they can't move very far. So that's what the biologists think. Now, this is what the climate scientists are saying. Freshwater population extinctions are mainly due to habitat loss. Frogs are very dependent on freshwater and the habitats. The introduction of alien species like trout in South American rivers or um, diseases brought over from the Far East by humans or rats. The introduction of alien species, pollution, because frogs have sensitive skins. We, we know all this now, don't we? We don't need the International Panel on Climate Change. Pollution, over-harvesting and climate change induced epidemic diseases. And we'll see later on, climate change is making that unpronounceable disease worse. Climate warming, particularly through the intensification and severity of droughts. Frogs are dependent on their freshwater pools. Droughts contributes to the disappearance of small ponds which hold rare and endemic species. Freshwater systems are particularly at risk of rapid warming, giving their naturally fragmented distribution. Particularly not just from climate change, but also habitat loss. And sometimes the two are combined. So those are the impacts that climate change will have on the habitats that frogs need to live in. And now, for the first time in the history of the Count Everything channel, an advert. And I've written an award-winning book all about animal behaviour and pheromones 
Yeah. Give, give us a title then if you've got a book to plug. <laughs> well, it's Animal Behaviour and Pheromones. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, is it very expensive being an academic book? It's an academic textbook, so yes, it's expensive. But I've also written a very short introduction to animal behaviour, um, which is a small paperback and is also recommended. And is that on Amazon if you want to get that? It is. Yeah. Well, t- 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 tell us your name again so people can look it up. So it's Tristram Wyatt, like Wyatt Earp. Back, back, back to extinction now then. <laughs> Humans have been destroying frogs' habitats as part of the ecological emergency. Now we're destroying them as part of the uh, climate emergency. But the next stage that will impact the amphibians are extreme weather events. And we've now arrived at another freshwater pool where there are no frogs either, or at least I haven't been able to find any. Anyway, climate change. How will climate change affect amphibians? Just about every aspect of climate change will make it more difficult for amphibians. If we start off with heat waves, it's not unusual even now to see in the news uh, a local lake or pond got so hot it reduced the amount of oxygen the water could hold and lots of fish and amphibians die. Extreme heat waves can lead to large local fish kills in lakes when water temperature and oxygen concentrations surpass critical thresholds, threatening cold water fish and amphibians. But also it affects them in less obvious ways. More and increasingly severe heat waves can lead to reduce metabolic rates, disrupt breeding patterns and impact ecological interactions with predators, prey and pathogens. Everyone's going to be affected, but why are amphibians so sensitive to heat waves? Amphibians are ectothermic, cold-blooded, we know that, don't we? Meaning that their body temperature is dependent on their surrounding environment. As a result, they are highly sensitive to changes in temperature and are particularly vulnerable to extreme temperature events. Remember, all creatures on Earth, except for birds and mammals, are cold-blooded. All frogs have a different critical thermal maximum, a temperature above which they die. So they have to find places to hide and stay cool and moist. Just at a time, that frogs are dependent on their habitat to help them cope with the climate, there's less habitat about. The effective habitat that's available is getting smaller and smaller. Can frogs keep pace with the current climate change? We don't quite know the answer to that. It's the frogs that are adapted most to cool areas that are most at risk. Some frog species that live in high elevation rainforests and cool temperature areas with a thermal maximum of 29 degrees Celsius. Anything above that and they die. Do you remember? Last year or the year before in Britain, for the first time in weather history, we had uh, a day where temperatures went above 40 degrees Celsius, 40 degrees Celsius, and us mammals, we really complained about it. If you're a cold-blooded creature, like an amphibian, that's really much more serious. Changes of temperature extremes are often more important to these local extinction rates than changes of mean annual temperature. Changes in amphibian population abundances were strongly related to temperature variability globally and significantly related to precipitation variability in lower altitudes. Changes in heat and rain have big impacts locally, which is a problem because climate models aren't very good at modelling local extreme events. Sites with local extinctions were associated with smaller changes of mean annual temperature but larger and faster changes of the hottest yearly temperatures than sites where populations persisted. One-off extreme weather events are much more devastating than just the general trend of climate change. Here are the areas where amphibians live. Here are the areas where it's expected that extreme heat waves will make it dangerous for humans to live. Humans are mammals. It's likely to be more devastating to amphibians than humans. Anyway, now we come on to droughts. Climate change is exacerbating natural droughts, causing them to be longer, more frequent and more severe. Considering the critical role that water plays in amphibian reproduction, development and survival, it is no wonder that changes to water availability represent the strongest climate link driver of amphibian declines. This was all predicted 30 years ago, wasn't it? And you might be thinking, well, if we knew this 30 years ago, why didn't we do anything about it? Well, we've known about climate change for 30 years and that how much at risk humans are. No one's doing anything to save the human, are they? So we can't complain, really. And now we come on to floods. It might seem strange, an amphibious creature suffering from too much water, but here it is. Flooding disrupts frog habitats, reduces oxygen availability, increases predation risk and facilitates disease transmission. 
with climate change, some parts of the world will get more rain, some will get less. And remember, a warm atmosphere is able to hold more water vapour, so when it rains, it really will rain. So what have we learnt then? Heat, extreme cold, drought and flooding have all been documented as killing substantial numbers of amphibians from time to time. That's from the Frog Book, that was known 30 years ago. Extreme weather events such as severe storms and flooding can cause short-term population crashes and recovery can be hampered by the degradation on loss of suitable habitat and breeding sites. Particularly not just from climate change but also habitat loss and sometimes the two are combined. That's modern thinking. Disappearances of local populations within a species range are more frequent and better documented than whole species extinctions. This is how frogs are going to go. Isolated, not able to move that far. The individual colonies will die out. And it should come as no surprise that that unpronounceable disease is being made worse by climate change. New findings have led to an emerging consensus that interactions between chytrids and amphibians are climate sensitive and that the interaction of climate change and BD has driven many of the globally observed declines and extinctions of about 90 amphibian species. Well, amphibians have been around for 360 million years since the time of the Carboniferous and frogs have been around for 100 million years so they've survived previous extinction events and scientists say that animals cope with a changing habitat or a changing environment by what they call auto-adaptation and that means either they change the way they live i.e. move to new habitats, take a new role in the ecology of that area or they have to evolve. Many species are moving to higher latitudes as the climate warms but not all are keeping pace with changes in the suitable climate space indicating an inability for non-genetic autonomous adaptation because of dispersal limitations, frogs can't move that far, behavioural restrictions, they get stymied by a low wall, physiological constraints, they're not that clever. <laughs> but we sort of knew that already didn't we? If frogs can't move to new habitats, maybe they can evolve to be able to live in the current changing environment and changing climate and in fact that's what they've done in the past. Frogs are specialists, They've evolved to live in the areas where they live. In some ways, being a small isolated population gives you advantages when it comes to evolution because all you need is one individual who has a good combination of DNA. If it makes them more effective, they will reproduce more. That gene will spread throughout the population and they will quickly evolve. And it's no coincidence, for example, that Charles Darwin started thinking about evolution when he was on the Galapagos Islands with an island with isolated populations. This is what scientists thought though 30 years ago that there might be a problem with expecting uh, amphibians to evolve. Peripheral populations may be in a catch-22 situation with low variability either because they are small and inbred or because they have been selected directionally in marginal environments but need high variability to adapt for range extinction. That's what they thought was happening 30 years ago. This is what the scientists think is happening now. Genetic declines were documented in both common and already endangered species of fish, mammals, birds, insects, amphibians and reptiles. Becoming inbred and losing genetic diversity is a problem for lots of species, not just frogs. Frogs may have been able to evolve in the past with previous climate change that human climate change is happening far too fast. Genetic changes in populations require many generations and for many species operate on longer timescales than those on which the climate is currently changing. Evolutionary rescue of entire species has not yet been observed in nature, nor is it expected. Frogs can't easily move to new habitats and there's no prospect of them evolving in time to be able to cope with the new climate. Our scientist friend thought within the lifetime of people who are alive today so maybe the year 2100, then they'd be greatly diminished. Being greatly diminished is a problem. For widespread species to become extinct, some kind of double hit may be necessary, notably a first strike to reduce range and a second blow, often of quite a different character, to finish the job. The ecological emergency, humans have been destroying the habitat more quickly than um, it can recover. By the year 2100, the number of frog species will be greatly diminished. They'll be living in isolated populations, and then, as we've seen, it's the local extreme weather events, the local extinctions, that are much more damaging 
the general trend of climate change. So 2100, lots of, uh, possibly, hopefully, lots of isolated populations of frogs left. One by one, they'll be wiped out by extreme weather events and there'll be no prospect of them being replaced by other frogs because they're just too, far too dispersed and frogs don't really travel that far, especially when the habitat and the climate is against them. So that's, that's the answer to the video between 2100, maybe 2200. And that's how it will happen, a mixture of general trend and individual local extreme weather events. Well, I'm a bit disappointed. I haven't got any video of, of frogs. I have been coming to these woods in February and March to see if I could find any frog spawn. I didn't find any, I didn't find any tadpoles. But I did talk to a dog walker and he said when he walks his dog at night in the rain, his dog will find the frogs. So there are frogs here. And in Europe, frogs, or at least common frogs, are, are classified as species of least concern, which means they're not in danger, not in danger at the moment at least. But since I wasn't finding the frogs, I put a message in the Facebook group for the town and asked people if they'd seen any frogs in their garden ponds. In Britain there are 500,000 garden ponds, so it's a good place for um, frogs to, uh, to reproduce. There are tens of thousands of people in the group, but I did get about nine or ten replies. Two or three people said they still had plenty of frogs born in their ponds. Two or three people said, we normally have frogs or used to have frogs. One person said, in March, they could hardly sleep because of so much noise from the frogs. They said, though, so about two or three people though said they used to, but the numbers have declined, they thought. One person said, on the way to school, they used to see frogs born in the ditches at the side of the road. But now those same ditches are full of rubbish. I asked my mum and dad, they've got a garden pond. They used to have frogs in the pond and newts as well. And they said, this year they hadn't seen any, but they did report they do see a rat in the garden from time to time, a mammal, an invasive species that can easily move, that likes to eat frogs, will eat anything. So in some ways, what we see as a global, distant, philosophical problem is really something that's already happening all around us. That's the end of the video. We ought to give some credit to our, our scientist friend who inspired this video. And also, we ought to point out, although he sounds like a bit of a doomer, because, you know, he's saying frogs are very likely to become extinct, or in danger of becoming extinct, you know, an entire class, amphibians, an entire class of species, in around 360 million years, he's not giving up. I met him at a protest where we occupied the foyer of a big insurance company in London, asking them not to insure fossil fuel projects. Uh, we're here in the lobby of a big office block, 66 Threadneedle Street, which is the home to one of Britain's big insurers of fossil fuel, Talbot. What this means is I went through the book, so many of the animals would be going extinct, and rather than simply writing their obituaries, I joined Scientists for Extinction Rebellion to try to stop the global heating, and that's why I'm here protesting at an insurer's. Now, the thing about insurance is that it enables business. Businesses have to control their risks. And fossil fuel exploration and development is just the same. And the thing that enables the fossil fuel industry to survive is being able to insure these big projects. Now, what that means is they're very vulnerable if insurance stops. To the insurers, fossil fuel are less than 20% of their business. So the insurers don't need the fossil fuel. But it's an honour to speak to someone who knows so much about it and like from first hand rather than just from what they've read in The Guardian. So is there anything else you'd like to say while you're here or...? Just that we really would love more scientists to join us and to actually start taking whatever actions you feel comfortable with but try to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Although it's easy to say, well, it's too late, we can't do anything. Whether we can or can't get to a zero carbon economy in time, whether we stop destroying the natural world more quickly than it can recover, it's quite good fun actually trying to do something about it. Yeah.